like to welcome you to Boy Meets Wellness, a podcast that discusses the complexities, celebrations, and challenges of building a wellness ritual as a BOI, a person who is born obviously incredible. You are now listening to Boy Meets Wellness with poet, motivational speaker, and wellness lover, Evolve Benz. BOI, born obviously incredible, especially when you wear it pretty. Happy Friday, Boy Meets Wellness community, and welcome to the podcast. Today's episode is brought to you by Mar Media Productions. Mar Media is a media production company that produces, publishes, and uplifts the stories, art, and journeys of queer and trans people of color and the people who make our lives incredible. Today's episode features the amazing creative director and artist EC. EC, aka Cameron, is an award-winning brand and designer, digital artist, a professional in the design industry for over 10 years, and he uses his talents and skills to brand companies for maximum profit and success. Cameron is also the current National Executive Director for Alpha Omega Kappa Fraternity Incorporated and former Supreme Historian and Webmaster. He was a winner of the Marcom Award in 2016 and 2017. And also in 2017, he presented at the first Trans Tech Summit where he taught attendees the basics of logo design and comprehensive creative thinking. Most recently, he received the Emerging Leader Award in 2019 at the inaugural National Trans Visibility March for recognition of his work in the design industry and his work as their founding director of social media and marketing. Before we jump into this interview with Cameron, I want to acknowledge that today is September 11th a day in American history where the U.S. World Trade Center was attacked over 20 years ago. So many people that day became ancestors, and I could still remember seeing the images on TV in my high school homeroom. I send love and healing to anyone affected by this uh, travesty and anyone just still dealing with some of the discouragement that came from that day. My wellness tip for you this week is to find joy in painting. Through an amazing painting session with one of my favorites, Baba Rocks. Baba Rocks is a person that I really appreciate, an amazing artist. And even before COVID-19, I attended several of their events in person. And let me tell you, at their events, they offer this amazing chai tea, um, which they have been nice enough to deliver to me and my partner through Shelter in Place. So I really appreciate them. The tea is so yummy. And the work that they do to use the art of painting to heal folks is just, it's really amazing. So They have adjusted some of their offerings, you know, due to COVID-19 and aren't doing things in person. However, every Sunday evening on their Instagram page, they go live and they do a joy of painting a ritual with folks, paint, have conversation and hold space. So I'm going to leave their name in the show notes uh, so you can check them out. But the tip this week is to pull out, you know, pull out some of those painting tools Get down with Baba Rocks and do some joy of painting. Do some healing through the arts. Do me a favor. Pick any Sunday of this month. Vibe out and do some painting. Don't forget to check the show notes so that you can follow them and check out their amazing work. If you're feeling the episode and want to help us pay the bills, please head over to boygearstore.com and grab some of our amazing merch. If you use the code SUMMER, you get 20% off. And now for our amazing interview with my boy, and creative artist, EC. Hello, world. Welcome to Boy Meets Wellness. I'm hella pumped and excited about today's conversation with EC. EC, welcome to the Boy Meets Wellness community. Thank you so much for being here. Can you tap in with your full name, location, and pronouns? All right. Thanks, Evolve. Edward Cameron Alejandro Pizarro III, the legacy lives on. In Fort Lauderdale, Florida, uh, native to Somerset, New Jersey. My pronouns are he, him, and his. Thank you. So the first thing I always want to tap in with, because, you know, we're in this pandemic. Literally, we're living through this moment. How are you doing? Where are you sheltering in place? And what is what is your, like, routine right now to kind of keep yourself going? So I am in Florida, where the, in South Florida, where the numbers are rising steadily. So I've been sheltering in place in my apartment out here um, since the pandemic broke out. Um, (laughs) Oddly enough, when it first started to break out, I was actually in California and then I came back uh, home. So I've been, you know, I've been working from home. So it's a routine of like making sure I get up at a certain time, 
hit the gym, you know, try to hit the heavy bag a little bit, get some work done. I love video games, so <laughs> I'm going to play a good video game for a little bit. Um, and just try to keep some some sense of normalcy, you know, instead of talking on the phone with my friends, maybe FaceTiming them so you can get that type of interaction because uh, I'm very much a, my love, love language is like a touch type of situation with the people I, you know, truly, truly care about. So that's what I've been doing. So you was in one hot spot and you went to another hot spot. <laughs> 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 that's what you pretty much telling me so you just you just been traveling in the land of the covid you know just in the rona all out in the road of it <laughs> i mean yeah you know like when my job calls i have to work so you know i go work and uh it, you know they prepared us to let us know like this is what's going on you know but as soon as we got out there it was like yeah we sending y'all back home and, you know, I thought it would be good to go back home. And then I saw the numbers out in South Florida. I was like, well, huh, there's that. <laughs> yeah, that's real. Well, thank you for being one of our essential workers. And I really do believe that artists are one of our essential workers as well. You know what I mean? Like the work that you're creating as a creative director, as a graphic designer, is just as needed as some of the health policies that's going on, right? Like we have to be able to communicate it, see it, market it. So thank you for being out there and being willing to go from hotspot to hotspot, not only to get the bag, but to create things that I'm sure support our community. You know, that's appreciated. I was going to say people didn't realize because like I was still busy after the fact and they were like, how are you still busy? I was like, there's a pandemic. People need signage in, Mm -hmm. in everywhere health departments need to produce stuff. I was like, this is not slow for me. Like, it's a lot of work. But that, yeah. And it was a slowdown for, for a lot of that stuff that people were trying to get produced. So I know even my company, I work at a university, we were looking for outside freelancers because a lot of the f- places that we would normally go through for larger things were like being shut down or people weren't able to work, right? In the same capacity. So yeah. I think freelancer game really like shifted so who are the people in your journey who make them incredible? Like who makes your life incredible? If you had like gratitude list, you was on, you know, with Oprah. I consider myself sometimes the masculine center Oprah. Who are the three <laughs> people who you would put on the top of your gratitude list? Who? Um, my grandmother, first and foremost. She, my grandmother is everything to me. She has always been there she's always been one of to listen um she's always she's just always been that that down ass grandma like (laughs) my grandma is is down um and she loves me unconditionally and i I think that's very rare uh as a train a man of trans experience coming from the family I come from to have the elder be the one that is down for you a hundred grand every time. Um, Also given honor to my ancestors, I would say my grandfather, um, Edward Pizarro Sr. The first, uh, he was a musician, he was an artist, he is, the reason I am an artist and so into music and sounds and visuals. Uh, he was a musician as well as a kindergarten teacher. Um, great man, great man. And then my third, I'd have to say my best friend, Van, Van Bailey. You had him on a, a, a few episodes ago. And me and him, we, we go back. That's like 15 years worth of friendship where I met him when I was, you know, ripe. <laughs> I was like 19, 18, 19 years old. And we were both really young. Um, and it was like before, you know, before Harvard, before the doctor stuff, like before all of that, like we just saw each other in a different light. And I'm honored to have him in my life. And we've kind of both gone on this journey together uh, in a way. Um, And he, whether he knows it or not, I don't think he knows the amount of impact he's had on my life to see the way he moves and shows up in spaces. I feel like a lot of times that allows me to show up in spaces just how I am and be like, yeah, you're going to take me seriously because I said so. 
Um, so I would say those are those are the three people. That's lit, man. Yeah. Thanks for bringing that grandmother energy in the space. It's nothing like being granny's favorite. I was my grandmother's favorite, and I always say, like, you know what? Like, you know, y'all can hate all y'all want, but you know, um, even though she's not here, God rest her soul, I still feel like her favorite. Like, she loved me so good, you know? Yeah, so, yeah. And, and you already know I love Van. Shouts out to Van Bailey. If y'all have not checked out my boy, please do support, bring them to your campus, to your institution, somewhere to talk their brilliance um, and share their story because literally I always say if I had met Van and probably Kai, Mm -hmm. I don't know if I would be here. You know, like people who really you've had some conversations when it was like that moment where you're like, I'm about to just give up. And they're like, nah, nah, you not. (laughs) And get you back in the shape real good. Get you back in the shape real good. Yeah. Van, Van is, Van has been there through, I've been through a lot of trying stuff, even with my family um, and relationships. And Van's been there every step of the way. Um, And if I had a fourth honorable mention would be my spiritual advisor. She's my friend, but she's like my spiritual advisor. We do business together. She's kind of all of the things. um, Latoya Papillon, her. Uh, She's a wedding officiant and an ordained minister down in uh, New Orleans, Louisiana. And if, with her and Van combined, like, I feel like they've literally just been, like, the glue that keeps me together. Because, damn it. <laughs> if, it was, <laughs> if it were for them and a praying grandma, I, I don't know if I'd be talking to you right now. And that's Man. real. Uh, Shay, I'm so happy you have a community that um, that loves and supports you. So speaking of community, let's talk a little bit about your upbringing. Where did you grow up? Um, and what was like your family's relationship to money? Like, this is a question I have, a new question I've been asking folks, because, you know, we're really talking about money mindset and motivation Mm -hmm. and your well-being. Um, we talk about being boys, people who are born, obviously incredible. So where'd you grow up and, and what was the money like back in that time for y'all? All right. All right. Um, so I was born in New York city, um, raised in New Jersey, uh, between East Orange, New Jersey, and Somerset, New Jersey. Somerset's like 15 minutes outside of Rutgers main campus in New Jer- in, uh, New Brunswick, New Jersey. Not even 15, maybe like five. It's literally down the street. Um, <clears throat> money-wise, I grew up pretty, pretty privileged from a Black queer standpoint. Um, upper middle class, both of my parents are... D9 Greek affiliated. Um, so they were, you know, and my mother does did a lot of does and did a lot of philanthropy. So I, I, I remember doing a lot of going to a lot of like award dinners and things like that. Um we had a house from the time I was eight. We moved into a house. Um, and it was uh one of the largest houses uh in on the block that I lived in. We always had nice things. Uh, and I, and I'm I'm gonna just keep it real. I I didn't grow up the way people would think. So when I say I broke the mold, like I I shook I shook some shit up with with me living authentically as myself as EC. Like I, I I'm constantly shaking the table. Uh, but money, like my, both my parents had a corporate job, uh, worked in New York, so. You know, they did the commute back and forth. We never really saw them struggle for money. As I've gotten older, I, I kind of realized some different things. And, you know, I'm not going to put their business out there, but, you know, I, I know they had to, like, refinance the home in order for me to start college and, and things like that. But money was never, I, I can't say we were ever taught how to budget, really, like, real responsibilities of like what comes with living on your own what are all the things you have to pay so I learned that fairly quickly uh once I got my first apartment when I lived in Virginia so growing up like that that from a child you know that was the relationship with money um and I and I have a very uneasy relationship with money um a history of money being used as a way to control my behavior and control my actions um so you know of course it's a capitalist society so we're all trying to get to the bag but when it comes to close relationships uh 
intimate relationships or, you know, just friendships and, and things like that. Like money is a very, you know, I'm always going to ask what are the conditions that come with this money. Um, and that's something that I'm unlearning, uh, knowing that people will genuinely help you if you need it. Uh, but, you know, there was money growing up, but the there was a lot of attachments and a lot of conditions to access to said money. So, That's you know, real. you know, it, it it's complicated, you know, mm-hmm. like it's not, it's not cut and dry. It's not, you know, a cookie cutter thing. You know, I, I, a lot of times I saw my sister get some things that I necessarily didn't get, but wanted. Um, and, you know, I, I know what that was, was wrapped in, you know, mm-hmm. I, I came out when I was 15. So for the first time, right. So, you know, Money is like, I really believe money is the root of all evil, um, but I can't sit here and, and lie and say, like, I'm not trying to make money. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> because exactly. I got to survive. You know? Yeah. And that might be tied into your journey as an entrepreneur, right? Like, as soon as you said that that quote, and I'm definitely going to pull that out as a, as a sound clip around, you know, money is cool, but when people start to control try to control you through it right it doesn't feel good and I think that that's really why a lot of folks take that lane of like being an entrepreneur because it does give you a little bit more control and agency on even who you work with and how you work yeah. with them right yeah. so do you think that that was a part of of your path there to like working for yourself I mean I think I've always had a a like work for myself thing like even when I was younger I was I was into cooking. I did a culinary program my senior year I'm um, in high school. That was like an accelerated summer program. Um, so I was, I'm still very much into cooking. So like I used to bake cakes for um, family birthdays and stuff like that, you know, before cakes got all fancy, where it was just like, you just had a cake and it didn't necessarily say happy birthday, but it was edible. <laughs> um, so I've always been the type to figure out what talents I can use um, because I, you know, I write, I paint, graphic design, I do video editing, like all of these things are different ways that, you know, I express myself. Like I'm even in the process of uh, reteaching myself the piano. Um, I, I played the piano when I was younger. And I think is, I like the freedom more than anything. I like the, as you said earlier, the agency to be like, all right, what am I going to do today? All right, I woke up at 10. I'm going to go to the gym, hit the heavy bag for a while, come back in the house, take a shower, eat around 12, 1230. Let me do some work, maybe take a meeting, excuse me, then play some video games. And, you know, I do my best work overnight. So then it's like, I'll oh, play some video games. I'll oh, find 930. Let me, you know, plug in and get a bunch of work done. Um, I like that agency to say, I'm going to work when I want to because, you know, I build my own timelines. I set my own deadlines. Um, so I think my entrepreneur, entrepreneurial spirit really came from not having other people have control over me. So that, like, I have control over myself and over my time. That's beautiful. I mean, I that that little moment right there, I was like, you know what? That's another tip. Like, usually it's all about the bag for people. Like, I just want to be a millionaire. I just want to move to Hawaii. I mean, I'm not going to say I, I don't want to be a millionaire. I'm not, I'm not going to say all of those things. But, like. But there's a deeper like, freedom there. There's a deeper freedom that you're, that you're talking about. Like, this this. Yeah. Con- this not even this control, but this agency of time. I really think it's brilliant. Um, but why design? Tell us why design. Like, where did you, were you just sitting in class one day and you was like doing on a piece of paper and your teacher was like, yours is better than everybody else. He was like, I'm a designer. Or like, how did you, how did you get in that moment? I actually like accidentally stumbled across it. So uh, when I started college, I didn't go the traditional route. Um, I started the summer program at Hampton University uh, as an engineering major. Um, as a masculine presenting person, I didn't really feel comfortable at Hampton. So at that, after my first year, I transferred to um, Old Dominion University in Norfolk, Virginia. Um, still as an engineering major. 
And I was doing well. My GPA was fine, but I was bored out of my mind. I'm not even going to lie. Like, I love buildings and uh, building computers because I was between computer engineering and civil engineering. And I love math and science and all those things. And I was just like, this is boring. And I figured out it was boring uh, during my uh, fundamental <laughs> of uh, building foundations, where we literally, like, it, the whole thing was about how concrete dries. And I was just like, I don't care how concrete dries, right? And I was working at FedEx office, which was Kinko's at the time. And I had been dibbling and dabbling in their sign and graphics department, just playing around, you know, not really taking it seriously, just, you know, creating signs. And one of my coworkers um, was a black man. He was going to Norfolk State and a phenomenal artist. And he was going for graphic design. And he was telling me, he was like, you know, you can like hone this and like go to school for this and actually like get a degree. And I was like, what? Like my mind was blown. And at that point I was like, all right, I had to change my major to graphic design at ODU. Um, and then ODU started football team. And first thing to go when sports comes, it's the arts. Um, and it was kind of like the perfect storm. They were defunding the program. Uh, my grandfather was getting really sick. Um, he had eventually passed away. I had got really sick um, and was hospitalized for some time. So I ended up withdrawing from school. And I was just focusing on like my health, my mental wellness, and working. Um, and around the time I, I got like, all right, now I want to, I need to finish this because I was getting jobs, but I couldn't go any further because I didn't have that education um, to get that agency experience. So in about 2010, I started looking to go back to school and I was really watching football and a thing flashed across the screen that there was an art institute opening up from around the corner from my house at the time. And I went and applied and two years later, graduated and entered the corporate field. Wow. So you you literally manifested that because you would sit there and you said, I want to get back in. I need this. And a commercial came up. That is like a beautiful moment. Uh, yeah. So, like so I was ready to pack up and move. And I had been in Virginia for like eight years. And wow. I was ready to just pack up, move, go to a new city to start school. And, you know, literally just popped up across the screen and I was like, let me do a little Google search. And then they, I went in and they was like, I had enough credits where I could graduate with my bachelor's in two years. And I was like, two years. All right. And I uh, started January, 2010 and I graduated December, 2012. So what was your first job out of school and, and how did you make that shift to be working on your own? Um, so I, I worked in the corporate sector for about eight years. Um, I'm not going to lie. I'm still currently in the corporate sector, but working as a contractor instead of a full-time employee. Um, so. And really quickly, cause some of our audience might not know, what do you mean by like a corporate sector? What are, what are some companies that consider part of that? Uh, let's say, um, HP, Dell, Google, Apple, Bacardi, um, any of the, the huge names, you know, Ciroc, uh, Barclays, uh, you know, Capital Records, that's the, the corporate sector for designers, is these big companies um, that are producing, you know, content, Target, Walmart. So you were there for almost a decade, and you still are, but just in a, as a contractor, what, what for you is different from being, I guess, a contractor and like uh, the, the nine to five employee in, in that sector? And what are some of the benefits and some of the celebrations that you've been able to do with that shift? Um, the contractor role gives me a gives me the agency to say no. Like if I don't want to work, they ask if I'm available. It's not a you have to come in at X, Y, and Z time. The question is, hey, are you available during these dates for these amount of hours? So it's more of a negotiation for me because I can easily go in like, yeah, I'm available these days, but I can't work this day, this one day out of all of those days. And it's like, oh, okay, cool. You're on the schedule. Um, and if I'm not available, flat out, like I'm not available. And it's not, it's not held against you. It's not like, oh, 
he didn't come through for us this time, so we're not calling him again. No, it's okay, we'll go to the next person. But the next time something opens up, we're still going to call you. So I, I, I like that agency to not feel bad when I say no. Like, granted, I don't have health insurance. I don't have paid time off. All of those like perks that come with being a nine to five employee. But I like the agency to say, you know what? Yeah, I want to work 60 hours this week. Or no, I don't want to. And I'm going to stay over here and work with the clients that I have. Like, because I don't have to. Um, That whole like what you have to do. I think that nine to five, you automatically get that you have to. Um, And then it takes the fun out of it. (laughs) <laughs> That's real talk right there. And you talking about other clients as well. So it also gives you the bandwidth, right, to be able to work with other people while you're working with this particular agency. So you can do some of that private, probably like smaller consulting work. So tell us a little bit about like what tips would you give folks who are interested? I know I've been seeing a lot in the media about how even the design world is shifting where people don't really need degrees as much. Like people are going through like boot camps and doing a variety of things to cut the school and get to the money quicker. Would you suggest that? Or are there some tips you would suggest for folks going into the field right now? Um, I would say take the path that makes the most sense for you. I don't necessarily think it's the degree that makes or breaks a designer. Um, But I do firmly believe that you have to know the rules in order to break them. There's books, there's YouTube videos, uh, there's Adobe conferences. There's all of these things out there in in the age of information is is at your fingertips. So I'm not going to sit here and say like, you have to get a degree, but you got to make sure that you're you're getting that discipline because the reality is, is that Graphic design is really about, from a business standpoint, is knowing your client, knowing your capacity, setting realistic expectations, um, and keeping those expectations, right? Um, You you don't want to, the one thing that my experience at school taught me is that my professors were all professional graphic designers, so they taught part-time. And they were graphic designers or creative directors at companies in uh, the Hampton Roads area of Virginia. So, you know, we would come in and, you know, we already know our assignment, project due, let's just say, you go in project due September 15th, right? You already know that the project due September 15th. We literally had experiences where the teacher was like, yeah, that project that I said to do September 15th, it's actually due September 10th. Stakeholders want it earlier. And those types of situations are real life situations, right? Like things shift in the market, in business, in marketing, in everything. Things shift. Just as quickly as this pandemic happened, things shift, you know, priorities change. Um, and you have to be flexible with that change and be able to still deliver with five days less than you thought. Um, So, you know, I'm not going to say schooling is the only way to be a graphic designer, um, but I will say there are some fundamentals to the business as well as to design that that need to be learned. And and those things, you know, can be learned through books and reading and mentorship, right? I think all of those things are, are fundamental and a necessity because, you know, I've been doing this for, over 10 years and I'm still learning because just like fashion design has trends. So you have to stay up on the trends. It's a constant learning. Uh, I think one thing is is people just think they can do it and they don't, don't respect the art of graphic design because it is an art. Real talk, real, real talk. So designer, designer, you did some pretty dope stuff. I think it was almost like a year to the day um, with that national trans March. And I was able to see, you know, some of your amazing work. What went into that and and what was that experience like to see, I guess, to see your art on that type of level, right? And to really see it center with so much compassion and empathy from the community. Uh, What was that experience like? 
um, working with the national trans, the inaugural national trans visibility march. It was humbling. It was honor. It was just cool. At the end of that march, I, I I cried tears of joy, and I'm not even. That's like no cap. <laughs> you know, like tears came streaming down my face because the the only way we marketed was on social media. Um, I was the only one behind the social media um, from a physical sense. And just to to see my artwork on that level, to get the, the messages from parents of trans kids, um, from trans people that are finding themselves and asking for resources and asking for connection, you know, asking for community. It made me realize, like, the march is so much bigger than any individual person. Like, that movement is bigger than any individual person because it's a movement for humanity, right? Because once the the most marginal, most marginalized of us are free, like, we're all free. And, you know, that that starts for me innately with Black people, Black trans people, Black disabled people. Black trans disabled people, like all of those things, like that's where it starts for me. So to be a part of that, you know, and to do it alongside um, the people that I did it alongside with, like it was great, you know. Um, There were only three trans men on the critical team. All three of those trans men were Black. And that wasn't a Black trans march it was just a national trans visibility march you know you know and you build lifelong friendships with that right like me and sean demons you know i just spoke to him the other day (laughs) um when i am in cali you know we were supposed to link up right before the pandemic hit um so he you know to have that experience and you know sean demons is older than me you know um so he's an elder in a sense. And to have that relationship with an elder man of trans experience just is, it just blows your mind. Just it, it, like you said, like you got to see yourself in order to realize that it's even a possibility to grow old and be yourself. Um, so yeah, that, that whole experience was phenomenal to get 6,000 people out there, I think the the unofficial numbers were like six thousand two hundred and ninety seven, and then like to sit back and like I, I'm not one to like really think about what I do. I just kind of do it because it makes sense. Um, but to see that, and then to see the people just keep coming, and to see people that were in D.C. that weren't a part of the march join the march, like that was the that was the thing for me right like we had the rally before so people were there they saw they heard angelica ross speak they heard asking the repressive speak you know they heard all of these things and they marched with us for people that didn't hear it but just saw the signs just saw the trans flag and they joined the march you know yeah that. Hey, history, man! Like that yeah. is that's that's history. I'm I've got like a little chills right now, right? Because you know when I think about even the the photos from from Stonewall, you know, and the photos that were captured at this event is so similar in in, in the sense of like it's an act of resistance. But these are things that y'all were able to capture because of the impact that we'll be able to have forever. You know, to for people to be able to see just your images are going to provide so many seeds um, that y'all planted. So it was, I mean, I wasn't even there and it impacted me on the social media lens, you know, just to be able to see the impact. I was kind of like, man, like, man, why didn't I know? I wish I would have known. But at the same time, I was so happy because it was like, oh, I know this person. Oh, I know. Oh, I haven't seen so-and-so in a while. Right. Like it was almost like y'all called everyone in so we could see that everyone was okay as well, like in, in alive and to, and to reconnect and like this, this big family reunion. So Congrats to you. I'm I'm hella proud that you did that. So my I got a couple more questions and then we're gonna shift to the last segment of the show. And I you know, we're not we're not um dissing nobody out here because you don't you named a couple of big names that you work with. 
but who was the best client? Like what was the, not even, not even the best bag, but like the thing where you really got to get in as an artist, where you were really proud um, and it went really, really well. I would have to say to like get in as an artist. So there's, there's two. So right. For me, like to get in as an artist and then to shift my mindset of how I saw myself as a, as a person, as a business owner, as a uh, entrepreneur, um, I would have to say Latoya Pappy on her winning moon weddings and Lato- of and of Latoya Pappy on her.com as well as Angelica Ross. Um, I met Angelica Ross, I think that was 2015, six. I, I don't recall, but she opened up a uh, uh, trans, she has her nonprofit, um, trans tech social enterprises, and she opened up a hub out here in Miami. And I went to listen to her speak. And, you know, for those that don't know, Angelica Ross, Candy from Pose, America Horror Story, all of those things, right? Um, she just hosted the uh, Black, Black National Convening. So, you know, of course, I, you know, she's a, you know, like, quote, celebrity in, in the community and now in just Hollywood, period, right? Um, so at this time, this was before Pose, I literally went, listened to her speak. She gave people opportunity to speak to her afterwards. And I literally just said, hey, I'm a graphic designer. Um, and anything I can do to help what you're doing, like, I'm down to help. And, you know, you say that to a lot of people and you give them your card and, and you never hear back from them, right? And that didn't happen with Angelica. Like, I heard back from her. There was follow-up. And then when she put on her first summit in Chicago, she she made sure that I was there helping with the tech support day of. I presented. I was an integral part of helping with the social media for the event. Like she threw me right in. Like, what do you want to do? And she made sure I was good. You know, there was no, you know, privilege in it from a standpoint of like at that time, you know, my grandfather. Charles, he had just passed away. So I was literally going from a summit to a funeral, right? Um, And then to a fraternal event. Um, So she just, she was there. Like she cared and she really like tapped into me and was like, Cameron, you could be doing so much more. Like you, you can do so much more. And I, I have a thing where I, I don't, it's hard for me to talk about myself. You know, like this interview is a lot for me because I don't really do things like this. I, I'm more of a behind the scenes guy. But she really opened up my eyes to like the business side and how my my corporate experience as well as my education, yes, it is a privilege, but it's also not a hindrance. And there's a way that I can use what I have to always reach back. And with Latoya, her wedding moon weddings uh, business in New Orleans, Louisiana, I'm responsible for all of her creative. And she pushes me when it comes to creative. Uh, I I joke with her that she's one of my most difficult clients, but she's also one of my most fulfilling clients. Down to her branding, her website. Now we're doing merch, t-shirts, and I'm responsible for all of it. And we're friends, but we're also, we're those friends for each other that are both going into business for themselves and both betting on themselves. And she was one of like my first clients when I first started out. Um, And she's trusted me with her business. And like, we relaunched her business probably about a year, a year and like a couple of weeks to the day. Um, We launched it with the, the whole new branding, whole new website. And since then, she's been on Married at First Sight. She's been featured in Martha Stewart Weddings. Like, and, you know, she had to check me and she was like, I know I'm featured, but understand, like, I'm getting these features because you've made me look so good with my website, with my branding, with my social media, like all of those things. You know, for me, it's just like, I'm just doing my job, you know, um, but to have, I love Black women. And I can say that those two Black women have 
propelled me in a different way when it comes to my art, when it comes to my business, and when it comes to me as a man and as an individual. Beautiful, fam. You're just telling all these touching stories. I know you say you in the background, but you are an amazing storyteller. So you, we need you to be here sharing, <laughs> sharing your energy, sharing your expertise more and more often. So what are some, what are some tips you would provide for folks around the imposter syndrome of negotiating your price? Right. <laughs> um, that's something that I'm working on. I know you probably working on. But, you know, one tip I always give folks, always ask for more, you know, even more than you're thinking, more than you're feeling, just so you can get used to asking for more. Right. Because I think it's important that that we push ourselves. But what are because I know that that's some of that is what you're speaking to. I I can feel it with Angelica Ross. Like what what did you get from that? Give us give us some tips. Give the community a couple of tips on how to to negotiate as a freelancer. Um, Everything you do as a freelancer, your time is, is valuable. So there's really nothing that should be free. I I want designers to get into the habit of if someone wants to work with you and they want to, you know, tell you their idea and what they want to do, you need to get paid for that time because that is a dialogue. There's a dialogue there, right? And even if they don't go with you, if you, you know, talk to them, prepare, your quote for them and all of this stuff and give them the creative brief that you came up with. And then, you know, they see the price and they're like, Oh, never mind. You've just wasted, you know, an hour and a half, two hours that you didn't get any money because you thought you were going to get a project. I'm not going to sit here and lie and say like, I don't have this issue currently. Um, I am working towards it. I think you have to value your experience right not just value your time like i'm at the point now i've I've been doing this for 10 years so i can do a lot of things quickly right but i can do them quickly because i've put in the work and the education and the research into doing it quickly right so you're not paying for me being able to do it quickly you're paying for the fact that i have these years of education and these years of research and these years of experience as well as knowledge of the software, knowledge of the market, knowledge of printing, that's what that's what's valuable. So it's not always just your time. You are valuable. You as the individual are valuable. And I know it's difficult to put a price on that, but I always tell people, whatever you're thinking, double it and add about 10%. Because the worst thing to say is no. And then you're in a negotiation and you can negotiate. Right. And also don't don't think your prices are too high. You're just not pointing. You're you're not marketing to the right people. Your friends are not your clients. Those aren't the people that's going to pay what you're worth. Your friends likely going to ask for a hookup, things like that. Your friends aren't your clients. Like and I'm not saying don't help out your friends. Like definitely, you know, but what I'm saying is. If your prices are a certain range and you're seeing that like the people that you're getting aren't willing to pay that, those aren't your, those aren't your, those aren't your clients. It's not your client base. Right. And I had to learn that because I was getting in touch with people and they were like, that's just too expensive. And I was thinking about lowering my rates and I was like, no, I'm going to shift on who I, who I'm connecting with, who I'm networking with, um, who I'm marketing to on who can who can do this work especially as black trans queer people um a lot of white folks feel real guilty right now and they just want to hire us simply because we're black trans black queer black so double that (laughs) double that shit mad tax like worst they could say is no and you're no better you're 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 no better off than what you were before. But if you lowball yourself, you're going to be frustrated the whole project because you're like, I should have charged more. I should have charged more. I should have charged more. This isn't worth it. So. Whew. You just, you just spoke a word. <laughs> I just had to, I had to take a deep breath because <laughs> I need, I need to hear that. I just, I literally am in negotiation with someone who continuously tries to, to lowball me. And I'm about to say no, because you know, I know what the work you know, when you know what the works on the other side. So it's, it's interesting, but you gotta, you gotta do it. You gotta build that confidence. So let's do some manifesting. 
Let's Ooh. do some manifesting. Where do you see yourself in five years? Who? Um, five years. I'll be ooh, almost 40. Um, in five years, I hope to be alive. Um, because I'm not about to sit here and say like there isn't a war on black men and black bodies and black trans bodies. Um, so I want to say it's an honor and a privilege to even be able to think five years in advance. I want to be happy. I want to be fulfilled. Um, I want to be able to travel a little bit more. And I want the projects that I work on to impact society in a larger way. My baby right now, I'm a co-founder of Marsha's Web, uh, which is a resource directory for LGBTQ folks, QAI plus folks, always centering Black, Indigenous, POC, Latinx folks and organizations. I hope to see that resource be able to connect community. And I, I truly believe that the, the connection of community and the accessibility to resources will truly liberate our people. And when I say our people, I do mean Black trans folks. Um, yeah, I, 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 I hope that in five years that we are closer to a liberated people. And, and you know, that's gonna have a lot to do with that election. So people go vote, register to vote, know your voting rights. Um, <laughs> but yeah, that, that, that's, that's my hope, five years. So are you currently taking clients? How do folks reach out to you? What type of clients are you interested in working with? Um, I'm, I'm currently and, and always taking clients you can contact me at E Cameron Pizarro. Uh, that's P as in Peter, I Z A R R O dot com. And there you can see what packages I offer as a brand designer um, and speaking engagements. Always taking new clients. And I, I take clients who, you know, I'm, I'm a brand designer. So I'm, I'm not a client, I, I'm not a person that will work with someone who quote, just wants a logo because you need more than that. And I know you need more than that um, as a professional. Um, so if you're ready to build your brand uh, and, and branding is it's long lasting, right? Logos are kind of temporary, but a brand sticks with you. It makes you feel, it makes you connect. So, uh, that that's the type of clients that I look for when I start to work. So, yeah. All right. Well, let's jump into boy talk and hop. This is the final segment of the show. A little fun. I'm give you a few All questions right. and you just fill in the blank with whatever comes to your mind, whatever's on your plat- palette for this morning. So your favorite book is. Invisible Life by Elon Harris. If you could speak to anyone dead or alive, who would it be? And what would you do? Honestly, I would want to speak to my Uncle Greg, who whew, committed suicide um, almost a year ago. And I, I, would just, I would just want to talk to him and let him know that he is the man that I, I model myself after. That's what I would want to do. I say we lift him up. We celebrate his journey in this life and in that afterlife in both realms. I say. I say, I say. Money is evil. (laughs) (laughs) Sex is fun. And if it's not fun, you need to figure out what you like. Because if sex ain't fun, I I don't know what you don't. (laughs) My favorite song is Oh, that's so hard. Earth, Wind, and Fire. Ugh, their entire catalog. <laughs> <laughs> that's fair. That's fair. You can just leave it at artists. Because I was about to say, how are you going to pick one of their songs? Like, that's a real hard yeah. one right there. You picked yeah. pick the, 
a group that got some some hits, man. Yeah, that's um, my first concert. So oh, Earth Wind wow. and Fire. Yeah, yeah. My dad was like I said, music runs in my family. Like my grandfather was a musician, my dad was a DJ. So like that was my first concert. So Earth Wind and Fire, and then like my top current artist is Brandy. You know, go cop that B seven. <laughs> Yes, I really do like that album. It's pretty dope. I need to finish listening. I only listened to the first half. I need to go back and tap back in. So my favorite food is? Mm, macaroni and cheese, even though um, I'm lactose intolerant, I can't really do cheese like that. <laughs> I love eating mac and cheese. Baked mac and cheese. You know. Yes, baked. We have particular recipes, y'all. Yes, yeah, baked. Not don't everybody's. Cheese, not everybody's <laughs> macaroni and cheese. If you put eggs in your macaroni and cheese, I don't want it. Like, keep that. Um, you know, don't don't be sitting here adding like seven, eight cheeses. You know, just give me. And if you don't use macaroni with noodles, it's not macaroni and cheese. Let's just be real clear here. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, there's conditions to that macaroni and cheese. <laughs> ownership is power and last but never least ec is my ancestors wildest strength you sure are fam thank you so much for being on the show for coming to our community for sharing so many gems i i really appreciate you and i hope to work with you one day i just wrote that cool. down as a goal you gonna, you gonna help me let's... build out this brand we about to we have to get this going Listen, we're going we gonna to figure it out because we're going we gonna to connect anyway because, you know, we're definitely going to list uh, the Boy Meets Wellness podcast on Marsha's Web so we can get more people to find you and all that stuff. So, yeah, we're definitely going to work. Let's definitely work. Thank you so much for listening to Boy Meets Wellness. You can listen to more episodes and become even more incredible by heading over to boymeetswellness.com and checking out some of our resources. We really appreciate you. Have an incredible day. My name is Edward Cameron Alejandro Pizarro III, and I am born, obviously, incredible. Thanks for listening to Boy Meets Wellness. Stay connected on and off the show by following us online at Boy Meets Wellness. That's boy with an I. Until next time, go be 